Good morning. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Mackenzie Eaglin, senior fellow here, looking at defense budgets and strategy and the intersection where they meet up. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you today to talk with our friends from the Pentagon in their first public event since releasing this year's China Military Power Report. We will get to that in a moment. Just a brief, a few notes of administrative matters. Um, we will take uh, questions online as well as from our audience in-house, so thanks for coming out. Um, look at, if you're viewing, if you're joining us online, look at the screen and you'll see a prompt for how to submit questions via email and Twitter, I believe. Uh, before we, we welcome, again, uh, our friends from DOD, I just want to briefly also welcome my colleague, Zach Cooper, who's going to introduce them. And he's a senior fellow here. Zach and I have worked together. He's a, he's a man of many think tanks and hats, uh, as well as government service, NSC, and at the Defense Department as well. He's also a professor. And Zach, the list is kind of long, so I'm going to stop talking there so we don't like crowd out our, our special guests of honor. Thanks for being here. Well, it's, it's really fantastic to be here alongside two uh, really uh, leading experts on, on China and the Indo-Pacific more broadly. Uh, I think all of you know them, so I'll just do very quick bios. Uh, Dr. Eli Ratner is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs. He's had many uh, previously important jobs, including as Deputy National Security Advisor to then Vice President Joe Biden. He's uh, been a Senate staffer. He's also uh, worked at a variety of think tanks, which is clearly the most important of your previous positions, including the Council on Foreign Relations and RAND and CNAS. Uh, Dr. Michael Chase uh, is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for China. He also, uh, before becoming uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, has a long track record in both the think tank community and uh, up teaching at the Naval War College. Uh, spent a number of years at RAND writing long tomes about China, <laughs> just like this one that we'll, we'll be talking about a little bit. Uh, so we're really delighted to have you here, and thanks for taking the time. Yes, thank you both. So we just want to offer a scene setter, a moment for you both to just talk about the report, give our audience an overview. I'm sure everyone stayed up all night reading and underlining. But for those who didn't, please just maybe, uh, Dr. Ratner, if you could just give us a quick overview. Tell us what jumps out at you, what you want us to think about. OK, great. Well, thanks, uh, Mackenzie and Zach. It's great to be here at AAI. Uh, this institution has been a leader on defense policy, Asia policy, huge amounts of China expertise, two of, two of them here today, but, but many, many others. So uh, really, really glad to be here. This is an important institution for US policy and strategy. Um, so the China Military Power Report, for those uh, uh, who aren't as familiar, uh, is mandated by Congress. It's more than 20 years old. Uh, and it's an important document. Um, as someone who has been in and out of government, uh, this is, uh, in my view, and not just saying this as, as a DOD representative here today, it is the most authoritative, unclassified articulation of PRC uh, capability and strategy. Uh, and it was a good idea for Congress to do this, and we, we continue supporting it. It allows these kind of conversations that we're having today. It allows the American public. Uh, members of Congress to understand better the China challenge, and it facilitates the conversations we want to be having with our allies and partners about why we need to be working together in the face of this. So I think that's, that's really what the report is. Okay. Uh, in terms of the content and what's new this year, you know, the administration has been saying since the very beginning of the Biden administration, uh, we released a document called the Interim National Security Strategic Guidance. Uh, it was sort of an early national security strategy in which uh, China was articulated as the only country with both the capability and the will uh, to challenge the international order, reform, revise the international order, uh, to comport with its authoritarian preferences in a way that very much undermine core US interests and values. Um, and this report demonstrates the ways that is happening through uh, the military instrument that we see China developing not only the capability but actually starting to use the military instrument in a way that we haven't seen previously in a more assertive and coercive way uh, in, a, in a way that often runs counter to U.S. interest. And frankly, uh, this is why Secretary Austin and the department have articulated the PRC uh, as the department's pacing challenge. And we can talk a little bit more about that if, if you're interested. But the report documents this growing assertiveness, this growing coercion as it relates to the East China Sea, as it relates to the South China Sea, 
uh, on the line of actual control uh, against India and, of course, uh, against Taiwan. Uh, and we're also seeing it through the PLA's operational behavior, through their increasingly aggressive, assertive, unsafe uh, air intercepts, which is something we also, we also ought to discuss in a little bit more detail today. It's something important that the department have, has been communicating both publicly uh, and privately. So in the region, we are seeing this more assertive uh, and capable PLA. Um, but we're also seeing a more global PLA, one that is pursuing uh, um, uh, installations around the world, uh, very ambitious uh, aspirations to be projecting power, sustaining power overseas. So it's both the, the regional piece and the, and the global piece that's highlighted in, in the report. But let me turn it over to Mike here for some additional uh, insights. Sure. Thank you very much uh, for having us over. And uh, also thanks to the, uh, the team that, <clears throat> that worked on the report. Um, which is a, a you know a pretty uh, labor intensive undertaking every year, but uh, you know again one that we uh, are uh, uh, proud to be a part of because, um, as you just heard, this is really sort of the U.S. government's premier unclassified authoritative assessment of uh, Chinese military modernization, uh, and not just the capabilities the PLA is developing, uh, but the ways in which they are uh, are employing them, uh, including more coercively, and so just a few of the other highlights uh, I would note in the report. Um, you know, we cover the improvements of the PLA's conventional capabilities uh, that they continue to pursue, their Navy, their Air Force, their conventional uh, missile force, uh, what they're doing in space and cyber and electronic warfare. Uh, and we also talk about the capabilities that, um, that they're developing for strategic deterrence, their strategic weapons programs. Um, and so, uh, very importantly, we, uh, you know, we are charting the modernization, the diversification and the expansion of the PRC's nuclear forces uh, in this report. Uh, and they are, uh, they are developing uh, a nuclear triad. Uh, it is no longer just the land-based rocket force. They've added a sea-based leg to their uh, nuclear force and also reintroduced the nuclear deterrence and strike mission for their air force. Uh, and we cover in the report uh, projections for the uh, expansion of their uh, nuclear missile force. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have seen the uh, images of the silo fields that the PLA rocket force uh, is building. Uh, and we provide in the report an estimate of about 400 nuclear weapons uh, in China's inventory today. Uh, and we project out to 2035 when we expect that they'll want to have about 1,500 nuclear weapons. So this is a really big change in terms of what they see as their requirements for, uh, for their nuclear deterrence capabilities. Uh, we also track areas uh, such as what they're doing in their space and counter space capabilities uh, and highlight the, uh, the range of uh, different types of anti-satellite capabilities they're working on to include both uh, ground-based and on-orbit capabilities. Uh, and then, you know, we highlight some of the challenges that we face also because of their reluctance to discuss some of what they're doing there and the challenges that presents to, uh, to strategic stability, uh, just, just among many of the areas that we cover in the report. That's great. Uh, I highly recommend it. It really is exhaustive, detailed, and comprehensive, and it's an impressive product. So thank you for working so hard on that. Uh, I'm going to bring up the speaker's visit to Taiwan, not to talk about whether she should have gone, but to talk about if that particular event and the, the multiple day live fired you know, joint, I don't know, forcible entry or whatever, however you want to characterize what it was they were practicing. Um, I saw capabilities that could be applied to quarantine, not just an invasion, um, which makes me a little nervous. But did you see any new capability and intent that in that real world event that wasn't, or, or did that either reinforce what's in the report or wasn't in there yet? And of course, I don't want to get into too many details um, because this crowd already knows it. But you know, there were missiles fired within Japan's EEZ for the first time um, that that had happened. Closest. Uh, other missile targets were the closest ever to Taiwan's main island during the event. 22 warplanes crossing the median line, uh, 100 fighters and bombers deployed near Taiwan, 10 warships patrolling. Um, the Eastern Theater Command uh, for China, they carried out aerial patrols and several rounds of simulated attacks against vessels. So after that, the Navy 7th Fleet Commander said that, uh, he said, there's a term in Mandarin. I don't want to butcher the term. Okay, but it's <laughs> called nibbling like a silkworm. They just kind of continue to push the boundaries and see what they get away with. Would you guys, would you both agree? Uh, so tell me, you know, new, not new to you, and just new to us, or reinforces what's in the report? Well, maybe I'll say what's not new about that, which is that what we've seen is a pattern, uh, 
you know, Zach has been documenting this well uh, over the last decade, but, but a pattern of behavior whereby Beijing uses these kinds of events as opportunities to take steps forward of assertiveness and aggression that were very much already on the shelf and very much consistent uh, with a, a trajectory of behavior. And, and I think this goes in the category of things that we've seen over the years where they're using essentially an excuse of a geopolitical event to do something that they were planning to do all along. So I don't think this was uh, new in that regard. I mean, certainly the degree of coercion and assertiveness is new. Uh, I think what's, what's important about it and what's, what's important for this audience to understand is that what we are communicating as a government from a political military perspective and through our operations as well is that we're going to continue to fly, sail, and operate uh, in a way that is uh, consistent with international law, that is responsible, that is peaceful, uh, regardless of this behavior. And I think that's what's really important. Uh, and in the wake of this activity, we have continued to do that with uh, Taiwan Strait transits, other types of uh, freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. And, and one of the things that, again, uh, we have communicated to Beijing, the Secretary of Defense has communicated that if this kind of military coercion is, is meant to deter the United States from acting in accordance with international law, that's not gonna work. Mm -hmm. If I could just, before I turn it over to Zach, just push you a little bit on the sort of the, the timeline. You know, all of Washington agrees this is, this is the decade of maximum concern, I guess you could say. Maybe we, that's like sort of the baseline consensus. And then it's only a question of, you know, I've heard certain military leaders, for example, in recent weeks start talking about, you know, well, 2027 is, is, a, is a unique date, and you talk about that in the report, for a variety of military modernization and other reasons by uh, Beijing. Uh, but, you know, for example, some service chiefs have said, but, you know, I got to be ready tonight for the potential of uh, something, any act of war, which, you know, Again, quarantine does it may or may not be an invasion. Um, there's always tension between the services and the civilian leadership. Is, is that true? You know, is there some, is there a, a gap there between how you guys see the moment? You know, of is there more time? Do the do the DODs, do the defense civilians think we have more time than we do to prepare, or are you sympathetic to the uniform side that's saying you know it, it could happen any moment? So I don't think there's a gap. Uh, I think there is consensus within the department about the urgency of maintaining and reinforcing deterrence. Mm -hmm. So I think what we are trying to do and, and uh, what our goals are here vis-a-vis -vis the deterrence question is to ensure, as uh, Admiral Davidson used to say, that uh, when Beijing looks at this problem, today is not the day. Mm -hmm. So we understand, uh, and the report makes clear that uh, Xi Jinping and the PLA are trying to develop capabilities whereby uh, it would potentially um, make it easier for them in a way to uh, seize the island of Taiwan or to use military aggression. I think uh, our goal is to ensure that that is never easy for them to do rapidly or cost-free. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think what we are doing is taking actions now uh, to reinforce deterrence. And I don't, think there's a, I don't think there's a gap here. We have, obviously, uh, regular contact with uh, the leaders at Indo-PACOM among the services yeah. within the OSD in the joint staff, and I think we're all focused on uh, the deterrence problem. It's a today problem. It's a tomorrow problem. It's a 2027 problem. It's a 2035 problem. It's a 2040 problem, and I think we are getting after the different elements of deterrence that I think we are that we think are important for each of those wickets. But Mike, I know you've been thinking a lot about this. As yeah, well. no, I'm, I'm, I agree. I mean, this is part of what makes the you know the PRC the pacing challenge is that it's there are challenges that we could face in the very near term, um, you know, out over the next five years and beyond. And you know, we know that the as we uh, talk about in the report, you know, Xi Jinping has set goals for the PLA to accomplish in 2027, 2035, and all the way out to 2049. Uh, and we have to be prepared to deal with the challenges that presents uh, you know, throughout this uh, entire time period. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to pick up on that last point because I, I think the timeline debate is one that's getting a lot of airtime in Washington, and so it's, it's really important to be clear about it. And I, one of the things that I really liked about the report is it's, it's very clear about 
at least the capabilities that Beijing is trying to create between now and 2027, and as you said, 2035 and 2049. So let me characterize this and let you guys tell me if, if this is accurate. Um, for 2027 in particular, because that's been, you know, the, the debate in Washington is really pretty focused on that uh, five-year timeline for some reason. The, the report characterized this as, as, a, as an effort to build integrated mechanization, informatization, and intelligentization. And it's really about capability building, not intent, from how I read the report. Is that, a, is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, I think we, we view all three of those uh, markers, 2027, 2035, and 2049, as milestones for capability development. When uh, Xi Jinping has told the PLA they need to reach a you know, particular level of capability. Uh, so 2027 is as you described. It's the 100th anniversary of the PLA. It's the sort of the nearest term of the, uh, the three, three step um, you know, sort of uh, process that he's asked them to, uh, to carry out. Uh, when we get to 2035, they're supposed to basically complete the modernization of the PLA. And then looking out further to 2049, which is also their, their milestone for national rejuvenation, um, that's when the PLA is supposed to become a world-class military that's, that's uh, second to none, right? So the, all, all three of those we view as capabilities development milestones. I mean, I can answer your question part, which is, is it the, is it the belief of the department? And this gets, I think, to the, the sort of the urgency question that uh, Xi Jinping is ready to push a button on 2027 to say go no matter what. Uh, and our answer to that is no, uh, that we think that uh, there is a, there is a, uh, clear path, uh, one on which we are on now, to continue to deter PLA aggression. And that has to do with our own capabilities, it has to do with our concepts, it has to do with our posture, and updating that all in a way that makes uh, aggression against Taiwan uh, too costly uh, for a leader in Beijing that's still thinking about uh, China's, his goal of China's rejuvenation, thinking about the, the PRC economy, thinking about China's role in the region, uh, et cetera. Uh, so I think we are, and, and Secretary Austin spoke to this out at Reagan, uh, I think with a degree of confidence about where we are now on that question. Um, that may be a little, Mackenzie, about what you're hearing when you hear <laughs> leaders say, we don't think a, a PLA invasion of Taiwan is imminent, because that would be a really bad idea. For Beijing, that's I think that's what that's where that assessment comes from, and we want to keep it that way. Yeah. And I think that the the urgency that you're seeing clearly, uh, the United States has been primarily focused on other threats for the last two decades. That has changed, uh, in part, started changing uh, during the Obama administration. I think that accelerated under the Trump administration and really crystallized under this administration. And the United States is very focused now. The Department of Defense is very focused. It hasn't been that long. Uh, that we have been focused. And I think we're seeing great strides inside the department along each one of those vectors on the capabilities development, on the concepts development, uh, and, and posture and otherwise that are gonna reinforce stability and deterrence in the region. I think we're on the path to do that. So I hear people talking about 2027. The PLA has its goals. Uh, we have a, a vote in that as well. And I think we're, we're pretty focused on this effort. Uh, it's such an important point. Um, I, I want to sort of build on that by asking, so, um, you know, the department hasn't really come out and given one big statement about all of the things that we're doing to try and stabilize the cross-strait military balance. And I, I think there are probably a lot of good reasons for that. One is you don't necessarily want to um, reveal everything, but, but you do have to reveal something. So I want to ask if you can talk a little bit about some of what's going on to stabilize the deterrence situation, especially in the, in the cross-strait dynamic. Um, obviously, you know, last week we saw the B-21 rollout, which is going to be part of the capability side. I know it's hard to talk about some of the posture changes, and it's hard you know, for people outside government to understand operational concepts and how those are shifting. But can you walk us through some of the kinds of changes that you and others in the department are, are pushing? Yeah, maybe I'll start with the posture piece and then, and then Mike can pick up on, on some of the other elements because this is an area where, look, you open any think tank report on uh, US strategy in the region and uh, it is no secret that uh, US, the US forward presence in the region has historically remained predominantly in Northeast Asia, predominantly at uh, major operating bases and smart folks like yourselves have been writing, hey, we really need a more mobile, resilient, lethal, diversified, posture in the region. Uh, we agree. Uh, you know, that's 
uh, takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of diplomacy. Uh, it takes what Secretary Austin describes as hard government work. Uh, it doesn't just take making you know, big speeches and writing big strategies. It takes years of diplomacy. You're talking about uh, having to engage partners on their territory, uh, related questions related to their sovereignty. This is not something that you flip uh, overnight. Uh, and uh, that said, <laughs> I think it is fair to say that, uh, in my view, 2023 is likely to stand as the most transformative year in US force posture in the region uh, in a generation. And I think in the way that it took the Obama administration a couple of years, if you look back on the last period when there was sort of fundamental change, right, that occurred in 2011, 2012. That was after a couple of years of really hard work that uh, the Department of Defense put in, Secretary Clinton, Kurt Campbell, and others uh, to put the kinds of pieces we put in place in the Philippines, in Darwin, uh, LCS, and Singapore, which all came together. And uh, we've been getting after that over the last couple of years, and I'm hopeful that we're going to start seeing uh, the fruit of those efforts bear bearing quite soon. We've seen, uh, obviously, this week the Osmond talks between the United States and Australia. Um, not a lot of uh, details released publicly, but a lot of work being done uh, and uh, a announcement made about that the United States will be increasing the U.S. presence in Australia across all domains, uh, land, uh, air, and naval, uh, looking at uh, logistics and sustainment issues out of uh, northern Australia in particular for folks who have been looking at that, hugely important. Uh, when the vice president was in the Philippines, uh, uh, she announced what uh, the Secretary of Defense had already said publicly as well, that. We're looking, uh, we're working with the Philippines not only to continue building out existing EDCA sites, but to start looking at new EDCA sites. I'm hoping we'll have more to say that on the future. That's fundamentally important. Uh, of course, we're in the midst of uh, finalizing the uh, uh, pathway for a um, uh, conventionally armed nuclear powered Australian submarine. Uh, which may have some posture implications as well, and those announcements will be coming out uh, before the end of March. Uh, and there will be others as well. And I think as a package, uh, we are going to be making good on a strategic commitment uh, that people have been looking for for a long time to think about, OK, how is the United States going to be revising its forward presence in the region that is going to be, as I said, more lethal, more mobile, more resilient, and exactly reinforcing that kind of deterrence that we were talking about that makes some of these rapid, low-cost invasions nearly impossible if you have the right forces and, and presence in place. So uh, I know there's been a lot of sort of waiting with bated breath for some of these announcements. Hopefully, they're going to be coming uh, early next year. But uh, my team is very committed. The department's very committed. The secretary's very committed uh, to getting this done. And I think, I think folks are going to be uh, quite satisfied with the results that are going to be rolling out uh, throughout 2023. So more to follow on that, but we've seen some of it already with Australia, with the Philippines, and a number of important pieces will be falling into place. Great. Well, we invite you to come back anytime <laughs> to talk about the most transformative year for force posture in a generation next year. And in terms of the region, I, I welcome it. I'm, I applaud you for all the behind the scenes work. I know, I take your point, it takes a long time and it's a lot of people toiling away, and the rest of us only find out when we find out. So I'm excited to learn more. But let me give Mike a chance. I mean, on oh, just sure, yeah, I guess because it's yeah. not just the posture piece. Yeah. and want to make sure. I, mean, I, would, other... I would add to that that we're also uh, strengthening our space and cyber and electronic warfare capabilities. We're working closely to uh, to uh, collaborate more uh, uh, closely with allies and partners in those areas as well. So there are a lot of things that are um, not as visible, but are also really important in terms of how we are. Uh, working to develop our capabilities and our concepts and to make sure that we are, uh, again, uh, taking, a, you know, we've got this really uh, important asymmetric advantage in terms of our alliances and partnerships. And so uh, building on that to strengthen deterrence is, a, is also an important component of what we're doing. Uh, and then I would just add that, uh, you know, obviously Taiwan has a really important role to play here as well. Yeah. And so um, the work that we're doing to help support their transition to a more asymmetric a set of defense capabilities and to pursue their, uh, their institutional reforms, um, you know, to work on training uh, and so on, uh, also plays a really important role in, in the overall picture. Thank you for that pivot, uh, which re reminded me that I wanted to ask about uh, your friends in the legislative branch. 
you know, we see increasing alignment between the department and Congress on the urgency and on uh, the consensus about what needs to be done and what it might cost and when it, you know, slashing bureaucracy for everything from FMF to FMS to um, uh, replenishing stockpiles of munitions, for example, right, that, that we're providing to Ukraine. So if, if you were kings for a day, uh, what could Congress do that would be most helpful for you next year? Well, maybe j just quickly start with what Congress is already doing sure. uh, to say just thank you to the authorizers who put in a lot of work to get to where uh, we are today and hopefully will be in the near future as the NDAA uh, marches forward. Uh, the department welcomes the additional resources and authorities uh, therein uh, and uh, would really love to see the appropriations to match that authorization. So we'll be looking for that going forward. And, and you mentioned sort of alignment between the Hill and the department. I think what this also represents is growing alignment between Republicans and Democrats around this issue and for all the rancor in Washington that we all uh, like to talk about, uh, we see the uh, NDA in particular, the Taiwan provisions therein, as a really, really important bipartisan symbol uh, that parties are still willing to work together. I think the, the Taiwans obviously watch that carefully, Beijing watches that carefully, the world watches that carefully. So I would say uh, maybe the answer, and then uh, turn to Mike again for additional thoughts, I think the uh, what I will be looking for from Capitol Hill is to continue that bipartisan spirit around this issue. I know there are always going to be differences, uh, but for Republicans and Democrats to be able to come together, particularly with uh, uh, divided Congress uh, around this issue will be incredibly important, and Beijing would uh, love to see nothing more than this issue uh, get politicized and start pulling us apart. So I think maintaining that unity is uh, priority number one for 23. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, absolutely. I think, I mean, there's strong bipartisan support for Taiwan across administrations. Um, you know, we fully expect that that will continue. And, uh, you know, again, I think that sends a you know, pretty clear message to, uh, to Beijing. And, um, you know, the, uh, I, I think the more that they engage in intimidating and coercive behavior, um, you know, just the greater the sort of sense of urgency um, that, uh, that everyone has about trying to make sure we're doing everything possible to help Taiwan, uh, you know, kind of with the transition that they need to complete so that they'll strengthen their, their deterrence and defense capabilities and, uh, and become increasingly resilient. Okay, fair. So uh, I, I want to just give you an opportunity uh, both to talk about, you mentioned the global nature of this competition and the work that you're doing. Um, and uh, and I, I agree with you. I. In the report, you talk about the expanding overseas logistics and basing infrastructures for the PLA to project power, which is really kind of an American thing. And uh, I don't think we like it <laughs> when uh, others can do that. So I, I was struck because I, I was at a different panel earlier in the week, and former US Army uh, Commander General Ben Hodges, he was talking about you know all the logistical challenges um, for supporting Ukraine and bolstering NATO deterrence in Eastern Europe, and he talked about um, needing to change uh, ports where we offload troops and equipment and all kinds of stuff uh, mm -hmm. three different times because Beijing has increasingly, you know, private slash state-owned com you know, companies that are potentially state-owned, you know, keep gobbling up, you know, legally and allowed to do it, uh, different ports and, you know, whether that's controlling the, how the containers come off the ships or maybe they're just a stakeholder in the company of ownership. And so we're now in our third port in the region for, so we don't give away certain, I don't know, intelligence and capabilities. Are you seeing, you know, is this something that we should be worried about everywhere? And then can you talk about the global nature of this and then just kind of how do you confront a problem that's everywhere all the time? Yeah. Mike, why don't you? Sure. Yes, so, uh, I mean, it's increasingly clear that the PRC has uh, global ambitions for the PLA. I mean, this was something that, uh, you know, earlier in my career in think tank and naval war college days, we used to have a lot of debates about whether their uh, military ambitions were basically confined to the Indo-Pacific region or if they were global. And I think we've seen that they've, uh, you know, it's become increasingly clear that they're, they're global. Um, and this is, uh, you know, it's been uh, developing for a long time, uh, you know, it was maybe 15 years ago or longer. I think we saw PRC leadership, uh, you know, kind of reach the conclusion that they had global economic and security interests and that they needed to develop global military power to, uh, to advance those interests. 
And so we've seen the uh, development of some of the capabilities like their aircraft carriers, their large transport aircraft, the, uh, the uh, cruisers uh, that they've developed for the PLA Navy uh, that are obviously intended to kind of expand the reach of their military power. Um, and then uh, beginning with the establishment of their first overseas base in Djibouti, um, you know, we now see the pursuit of uh, kind of a global network of logistics and support facilities and bases uh, to help them uh, kind of build that out and become a, a global military power. And so they have uh, interest, as we document in the report, in locations uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, but also uh, beyond to include in Africa uh, and the Middle East. And so we're, um, you know, we're now in a, uh, in a relatively early stage of their uh, development of that set of global capabilities, but they appear to be very determined to pursue it and putting the resources behind it. Uh, and we see them um, pursuing basing or other forms of overseas facilities in a number of different countries, uh, you know, as we outlined in the report. And I would just say one of the interesting elements about this issue, obviously the, the global nature of it means that it's touching countries beyond the Indo-Pacific who are sort of generally at the front end of uh, worrying about PLA military aggression, military coercion. Uh, I think one of the uh, sort of a couple elements of this problem set, particularly as it relates to the military installation piece, the PLA has not been particularly transparent about this, uh, not to the world, much less not even to the target countries that they're looking to do this in. We've seen this pattern where uh, even when they're looking to establish military installations, they're producing, uh, um, let's say, not completely comprehensive uh, plans to the partners about what their intentions are. And so there's an educational aspect that needs to happen to countries around the world about what they're likely signing up for. I think there's an educational aspect to uh, our allies and partners around the world about some of these issues because there's a way in which this problem is coming home much more quickly uh, for countries around the world, and not just the United States, but others, Mackenzie, for the reasons you mentioned that are different from the sort of natural force projection capabilities emanating from the mainland and some of the security challenges in East Asia, which maybe still remain geostrategically distant from some of these countries, but the global installations question matters a lot to them. Thank you. I think we'll just do one more question yep. from us before we open it up for the discussion. Uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't ask you the, the nuclear question. Uh, you know, as, as we all pour over the report for changes in numbers of launchers and missiles, um, you know, one of the key numbers that's changed the most in recent years is the numbers of nuclear warheads and the, and the types of nuclear capabilities, as you already mentioned, Mike. Um, you know, I remember two years ago we did the rollout here of the military power report, and the number was in the low 200s for estimated uh, nuclear uh, deployable nuclear weapons. Now we're talking about something in the low 400s, so you know, basically a doubling almost in two years, which is pretty pretty substantial and rapid, and a real departure from the approach that Beijing had taken for quite a long time. Um, and it's, it's obviously not just the warhead numbers, you know, as the report talks about. It's, it's the triad, right? And so we're seeing a massive modernization program across all elements. Can you talk a little bit both about, you know, what you're seeing from the Chinese on that side and, and also if it is affecting how you think about our responses and our preparation, you know, how do you think about that, that challenge? Yeah, well, Mike's really one of the leading uh, experts in the world on PLA nuclear weapons. So let me let me turn it over to Mike. Sure, and, and um, I have some comments at the end. But Mike's yeah, here. so I, you know, I, I mean, again, I think historically the PRC was uh, comfortable with a very relatively small nuclear force, and um, we've obviously seen that change over the past couple of years. Um, you know, under uh, Xi Jinping, they have uh, embarked on a pretty rapid, uh, not only modernization and diversification, but also uh, expansion in terms of the numbers of nuclear warheads. <laughs> Uh, that they have, and that we project that they're um, you know, they're they're going to deploy uh, over the uh, the next um, you know sort of five to fifteen years. Uh, and last year's China Military Power Report, uh, we talked about uh, about seven hundred weapons by twenty twenty seven, and now um, you know this year uh, we're projecting uh, fifteen hundred for twenty thirty five. Um, we also see uh, other important changes: uh, movement in the direction of a launch on warning posture and a higher level of readiness, at least for some units um, of the uh, PLA rocket force. Um, and so I think this, you know, while the PRC states that their nuclear policy remains unchanged, they're creating a much more diverse set of capabilities that will put other options on the table. And they haven't been transparent about the intent uh, behind uh, the sort of 
change in trajectory that's leading them to these much larger numbers. And so um, we would certainly uh, you know, welcome greater transparency on that, uh, but they have been very reluctant to engage in discussions about strategic stability or strategic risk reduction issues. Um, and so um, you know, that presents uh, some challenges in and of itself. Uh, you know, of course, in terms of what the, uh, what the department um, you know, is doing, uh, we are also modernizing our own capabilities uh, on, the, uh, on the nuclear front, um, you know, as was outlined in the nuclear posture review. Um, and we continue to try to engage with the PLA to keep the channels of communication open, um, to uh, try to make sure that even as we have a, kind of an intensifying uh, competition, that it doesn't uh, veer into confrontation or conflict unnecessarily. Uh, but there we have some, uh, some challenges as well. They've been, you know, as I mentioned already, reluctant to kind of talk about some of the crisis communications and strategic risk reduction uh, types of issues. Um, and they also, uh, you know, have a long track record that they've continued of canceling some of the uh, exchanges that we've planned as kind of a political signaling mechanism, uh, you know, as we saw after uh, the, the Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan this summer. Uh, and so that, you know, kind of layers another set of challenges on top of this. Yeah, and maybe just building on this last point, which, which I think is really important because um, I can speak for the region being out engaging with partners day to day. They understand the growing intensity of the U.S.-China competition, the military competition. They're seeing what's happening. Uh, even our closest partners want us to be at least communicating with the PLA uh, in a way that will prevent miscalculation, uh, and other forms of inadvertent conflict. So the, the, the region is looking to Washington and Beijing to manage this competition more responsibly. And I want there to just be no doubt that uh, the Department of Defense, Secretary Austin, Chairman Milley, Admiral Aquilino, uh, and the Pentagon leadership have an outstretched hand to say, let's have a conversation here. Uh, we've seen some uh, openness to that. Obviously, the president met with uh, Xi Jinping on the margin of the G20. Uh, Secretary Austin just saw Minister Wei out in Cambodia on the margins of the ADMM Plus. But on the whole, uh, the PLA is not yet uh, willing or serious about trying to manage this competition in a way that we would expect a responsible or aspiring major power to do so. And we think that's a, a huge problem. Uh, and we are going to continue to be open to those discussions, but they're not happening yet at the way. Uh, we want, uh, not to mention what the region wants to see as well. It's a little frightening. Uh, great, we're gonna open it up for questions, uh, both here in the audience as well as online. I'm just gonna gently pivot, uh, stay in this lane for just a moment because we have lots of questions about their nuclear modernization, so I'll combine two. The first is from our, our boss, Dr. Corey Shockey. She sends her, her thanks for being here and regrets that she's not here in person. Uh, she's wondering, um, you know, obviously it's a striking modernization effort, and your point, Secretary Chase, about, you know, there's a lack of transparency about why they're doing it. I guess I won't ask you to speculate. We'll leave that for another day. But uh, she's wondering uh, if you're thinking about the risks of China, China teaming up with other nuclear-armed um, adversaries to us. And then a question from Tony Capasio. He wants to know if you assess that China currently now fields a viable nuclear triad. Okay. Yeah. So I think on the on the second question, you know, as we outlined in the report, um, they've got a sort of a nascent nuclear triad. The land-based rocket force was historically sort of the cornerstone of their nuclear deterrent for a long time. Was really the entirety of it. Um, they've now added uh, ballistic missile submarines that uh, conduct uh, deterrence patrols, and the uh, PLA Air Force, as of a couple of years ago, uh, you know, publicly confirmed that they were uh, back in the uh, in the nuclear deterrence and strike uh, business as well. So. So we characterize that as a you know sort of a nascent nuclear triad that they continue to um, to develop. Um, you know, on the first question, um, you know, I mean, yes, uh, you know, certainly uh, the modernization and the expansion that the PLA is undertaking, uh, you know, inevitably creates new challenges, um, you know, that we have to address. And you know, again, uh, as something that uh, our colleagues in the department who uh, are focused on the functional side on uh, on nuclear issues, um, you know, have talked about at some length. Okay, I'm looking out here to all of you to see if there are any questions. Um, okay, we'll start over here. Uh, good morning, J.P. Hogan. 
I'm remembering when Obama became president, there were stories that I think China was asking him to be less socialist because it was interfering with their moves towards some capitalism. So I'm wondering, under Biden's posture, is it labeling China of an imperialism, of expansionist communism, that it should be a threat imminent or existential to Americans' religious liberty? Or is he seeing it as a building a capacity maybe to be a global police force? Where are... Sorry, go Totally understand the question. Could I can yeah. maybe reframe it just a little bit? I mean, there's so there's a lot of discussion in the national security strategy, right, about um, the competition between democracy and, and autocracy, right? And I think you know this sort of goes to the basic theme, which is you know how do we frame the competition, right? We were just talking about the challenges of trying to manage a competition, right, and do so responsibly, but. But it is a competition, and as the as the president has said, you know we're we're in it to win it. Um, so I, I guess one way of reframing that would be: How do you think about um, framing this competition in the right way? You know, in, in ways that both help us build the coalition of countries that are like-minded, um, but but do so in a responsible way. So maybe one answer uh, to this question, uh, and we can. If you want to build on it, we can do that. I mean, it, it, as Zach said, the president has talked about the competition between uh, democracy and authoritarianism and the importance of demonstrating the effectiveness of our system at home uh, and the effectiveness of our coalition of democracies abroad. So that is an element of uh, the Biden administration's foreign policy. I think as it relates to the Indo-Pacific and the China challenge, what we are trying to do is what has been articulated as a free and open Indo-Pacific, a phrase that was generated uh, in Tokyo, uh, adopted by the Trump administration, and there's been continuity in that regard uh, in the Biden administration as well. And that articulates not a question of the domestic governance system, but rather the rules, norms, and institutions that we want to see prevailing in the Indo-Pacific, in which all countries are welcome to be part of. It is not uh, divisive. And I think one of the Interesting things, for those who enjoy reading government speeches, I would strongly, to answer that question, urge you to go back and take a look at the speech that Secretary Austin gave at last year's, or this year's, sorry, uh, Shangri-La Dialogue, where what he talked about was this vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific, but it not being America's vision, that it's a shared vision for the region. And if you look at the way the ASEANs talk about the region they want, the Japanese, the Indians, the Australians, even the Europeans, when they articulate the kind of order that they're interested in seeing in the Indo-Pacific. It is about one that is open economically, which the sea lanes are open, which uh, uh, disputes are resolved peacefully, in which actors are working in accordance with international law. And the, the concern that we have is that what we are seeing, uh, not only by what the PRC is saying, but what it is doing, is it is not aspiring toward that vision. It is not aspiring toward a vision where countries are able to operate freely in accordance with international law. And we see that on a regular basis because it is using its military, engaging in reckless, dangerous intercepts of US and allied aircraft who are operating in international airspace. At times, enforcing UN Security Council resolutions vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. Uh, so uh, that, to me, tells you everything you need to know about the kind of region that the PRC is envisioning. And then we see other forms of military coercion. So I think that's when we voice our concerns about some of this behavior. It's not in a tactical sense, but rather it's about this question of the re this type of region that the world is aspiring toward, and one in which we think uh, uh, the region shares, and again, talking about it not as an American vision, but as a as a shared vision, and, and I think fundamentally, that's what this competition is about. It's a fired up Secretary Ratner, I love it. Uh, <laughs> David Martin from CBS, you're next. So you've, uh, Wait for the mic, David. Sorry. Oh, sorry. You've uh, twice mentioned the uh, aggressive intercepts. Be more specific. I mean, how many have there been, and if the uh, 2001 incident in which the P3 was forced down is sort of your baseline. Uh, how, how dangerous are these, and is it only a matter of time before another plane gets forced down? Well, we hope it's not only a matter of time, but uh, this is really dangerous behavior that I would 
likened to driving with road rage in a school zone. All right, that's what we're talking about here. Um, we have PLA aircraft coming within tens of feet of uh, US and allied aircraft. We have them releasing flares and chaff. We have them doing dangerous maneuvers uh, around aircraft. Uh, and to exactly this point, uh, it is tempting a crisis that could have geopolitical and geoeconomic implications. And, and frankly, again, it could not be more important to underscore that these are operations that are being conducted in accordance with international law in international airspace that are being done uh, in a very responsible manner. Uh, and the response that we are getting uh, from the PLA is that they don't accept that activity. Uh, and I think that's a real concern. Uh, it is something that the Secretary has been conveying uh, privately his concerns uh, to the PRC leadership, but all, to the PLA leadership, but also uh, when he was in Cambodia just a few weeks ago and had a chance to address all of the ASEAN defense ministers and defense ministers plus, so the, the plus countries as well. This was an issue he raised. I think it is a real issue. It's real dangerous. And if it continues, then it does raise the risk of this kind of accident or incident. And that's something that we all have an interest uh, in preventing. So it is uh, fundamentally important that the PLA uh, curb this behavior. And it's something that we have seen only increasing over time. Uh, and it's, it's, it's one that we're going to keep talking about. Yeah, and I, I, sorry, I, go ahead, sorry. Is there any tipping point in which suddenly they started doing this on a uh, more frequent basis? And if so, is there any event you think that contributed? Uh, it is a pattern of behavior that has been growing in particular uh, over the last year and a half or so. So it's a, it's a relatively new phenomenon. Um, we've seen it in the air domain. Again, I think the, the uh, other important response is not only that this is dangerous, but what I said earlier, and this is not just a talking point. It is true that the United States is going to continue to fly and sail and operate peacefully and responsibly uh, wherever international law allows. And we have continued to do this uh, despite that kind of behavior. So if Beijing's intent here is, hey, we're going to somehow intimidate the United States out of operating according to international law. That hasn't worked. It's not going to work. Um, but this is, uh, again, very reckless behavior. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that it also underscores um, you know, how disappointing it is that the PLA has canceled some of the dialogues and mechanisms that are meant to allow us to ensure that we have uh, kind of shared expectations about safe and professional encounters between our air and maritime forces when they're operating in proximity. So. Uh, among the uh, several exchanges that the PLA canceled uh, earlier this summer, they canceled the MMCA, which is kind of our operator to operator level uh, dialogue about air and maritime safety, in which both sides have the opportunity to raise cases of behavior that they consider unsafe, unprofessional, or otherwise problematic. And so that is the, you know, that's a, a venue where we would normally be able to uh, to raise these incidents in, in, in great, um, you know, detail. And also where the PLA, if they feel as though we've done something that doesn't live up to the standards of, of operating safely and professionally, would have their own opportunity to raise their objections as well, um, but they, they canceled it, right? So these are the kinds of things that, um, you know, when Secretary Austin spoke with General Way at ADMM Plus, you know, he highlighted the importance of getting these dialogues back on track. Um, so we obviously want to see a change in behavior there where they don't engage in unsafe and unprofessional behavior that risks a collision like what happened in 2001, either with us or with one of our allies or partners. Uh, but we also want to ensure that the PLA will, will kind of do what, again, uh, what the region and the world expect, which is to try to manage this competition responsibly. Uh, and that you know, requires engaging in direct dialogue on these issues, not you know, canceling it when they're just pleased about something, uh, something else. Yeah, and I think it'll be important. Uh, you know, in the months ahead, we've seen uh, in the wake of the party Congress, clearly Xi Jinping reentering the international stage uh, after a long COVID period of not traveling. I think he's in Saudi Arabia, uh, or at least just was. Uh, he's been doing a number of international engagements, uh, saying a lot of pleasantries about uh, China's approach uh, to the region, to the world. I think the question, the problem is we continue to see a say-do gap between talking about stability and whatnot, and then the, and then the military behavior. And we think it's important that we focus on uh, not only what the PRC is do, uh, saying, but also what it's doing. 
Thank you. All right, before we go, we have wow, so many in the room. Let me just ask one more last one from online, and then the rest of you guys get here for schlepping to AEI today. Uh, you referenced it earlier, the great work by Congress, particularly in the defense authorization bill, which was made public yesterday. You know, they have a historic security assistance package for Taiwan in, in that bill. Uh, Two billion a year over five years for foreign military financing, one billion a year in drawdown authority. Uh, and of course, but as, as we all know, um, the authorizers sort of set the stage and then we need the appropriators to follow through. So um, are you working with and talking to them behind the scenes on making sure these things become reality? I think we're doing everything we can uh, to ensure that uh, those authorizations, if they come to pass, will be met by appropriations and look to our good friends and influential <laughs> think tanks to reinforce those, uh, the, those voices. But um, absolutely, we're, uh, we're engaged with Congress on these issues. Great. Great, thank you. So we'll go here in the room right here, and then we'll come over there. Thank you. Um, just following up on the NDA, um, uh, uh, there's going to be um, $10 billion for Taiwan uh, in grant in the next five years. And bearing in mind the, the challenge from China, you just the panel just mentioned, and also its goal for 2027, 2035, and even 2049, and also what's going on in Ukraine. I'm just wondering what kind of priorities the DOD plans to set for this um, grant to Taiwan. And secondly, if I may, um, if the next House Speaker plans to visit Taiwan, would you advise against it, uh, given the response that we saw coming out of China? Thank you. Let me uh, maybe just take the second question uh, first to say um, we recognize that these are decisions for members of Congress and, and for the Taiwan. So I would uh, look to them to answer the question of uh, whether or not uh, that something like that would be worthwhile. I think what I will say for our part is as a department, when we think through what are the kind of activities uh, or engagements that we think are important for us to do, uh, that we put a premium on things that are going to be, from a Defense Department perspective, reinforcing deterrence and reinforcing Taiwan's resilience. So that's the lens through which we look through our own activities, but um, we have made crystal clear, including to Beijing over and over, that we see Congress as a co-equal branch of government, uh, and uh, we'll continue to have that position. Good. OK. We'll, we'll try and go rapidly start here, and then we'll get to in the back before we conclude and let them get back to the building on time. Yeah, thanks very much. It's Carl Polzer. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts and maybe another reason to, to have dialogue with China. As the nuclear deterrence um, game uh, in game theory goes from a two country game to a three and maybe more. You know, we've had mutual assured destruction. You if you blow us up, we'll blow you up. Pretty simple, unless there's misunderstanding or, or irrational behavior. But now you have a third country. So if country A attacks country B and country B retaliates, there's country C in a good position to take over, do more in Africa. So if, how do you? <laughs> That's pretty complicated, especially given you these algorithms have to happen in an hour or so, you know, once an event happens and have to be pre, pre, pre coded. But anyhow, I'll stop there, but that's my question. How do you think about the chessboard of problems? Um, I, remember, I, I think it underscores the importance of uh, being able to have open channels of communication with the PLA, which again, um, you know, from our level all the way up to Secretary Austin and Chairman Milley, we've made very clear to the PLA uh, something that we would prioritize. Um, but it also requires them to be willing to engage in those discussions, whether it's on crisis communications or strategic risk reduction. And so far, we haven't uh, seen willingness on their part to, um, you know, to uh, engage in those discussions in the, uh, in the way that we would like and, and um, you know, would be most uh, you know, important to help address those kinds of some of the issues that you raised of uh, avoiding any kind of you know, miscalculation uh, or uh, uh, you know, sort of um, you know, misjudgment. Uh, and, and so we'll continue to try to work on that. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, Ken Scabia from Marbury Corporation. So I have uh, two uh, very quick questions. The, the first one is, uh, do you have any uh, concern or thought on the new Chinese member of the uh, Central Military uh, Commission as 
uh, their new vice chairman, who, is, who was a commander of the uh, uh, Eastern Theater, and uh, a new member who has been sanctioned by the US government. And my second question is, as you may know, the Japanese government is talking, uh, discussing about uh, the new counter-strike capability. So do, do you think what kind of the communication or uh, coordination uh, <clears throat> we should have, I mean, the, the, we should have between the US and the Japanese government uh, to, to operate this new capability? Thank you. Yeah, I'll take the question about the CMC. So uh, we do include in the report um, you know, information about PLA leadership. And of course, coming out of the party Congress, um, you know, we watch very closely both what, um, what they articulated in terms of their vision for their defense modernization. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping talked about strengthening what he referred to as their strategic deterrence system, you know, which gets to some of the nuclear and space issues that I mentioned earlier. And then, of course, also we saw a new CMC uh, membership. And I think that you, know, you can look at the membership of the CMC and see that they continue to emphasize uh, the uh, you know, kind of advanced uh, high-tech weapons capabilities, uh, developing the PLA's uh, operational proficiency. Uh, you can see also that they continue to attach a lot of importance to political work and to uh, 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 anti-corruption or discipline inspection, um, as, they, as they refer to it in their system. Um, so you, certainly you can learn uh, quite a bit from uh, the composition of, um, of their uh, military leadership. Um, they do have a, a new CMC member uh, who is uh, under US sanctions, and we'll, you know, we'll manage that in accordance with our, our own uh, legal and policy frameworks. And just on the Japan question, I would say um, we are obviously engaged in ongoing and regular and deep conversations with partners in Tokyo about the future of the alliance, uh, about Japan's roles and missions therein and the uh, associated capabilities with those roles and missions. We're obviously watching very carefully uh, as Japan is updating and revising its own uh, budget and uh, strategic documents. I think we're very encouraged by what we're seeing so far and looking forward to seeing the results of what will ultimately be a sovereign decision for Japan, but one that I think will uh, have great benefit to the alliance overall. Thank you. We have time for one more. Well, thank you all for this panel. My name is uh, Antonin Scalia. I work at uh, Palantir Technologies. I'm curious uh, how you all are thinking about this idea of uh, cognitive domain operations, uh, both how does the PLA understand this, what do they mean by this, and then how is the U.S. government thinking about what our response should be to cognitive domain operations? Sure. So it's a, it's one of the operational concepts that you know we we have highlighted in uh, in uh, various editions of the China Military Power Report. The kind of uh, overall approach that they're taking they refer to as multi-domain precision warfare, which we talk about in there some as well. But uh, the cognitive domain warfare part of it is something we've seen them emphasize in their professional military literature in recent years. Uh, you know, it has elements of psychological warfare of cyber operations. There's uh, you know a variety of different uh, kind of components of it, sort of political warfare. Um, you know, and uh, it just, I, I think it illustrates how central the competition in the information domain, um, you know, is in the kind of broader military context. Um, and so that's something that, you know, that we'll continue to address, uh, you know, along with our, our allies and partners who I think, um, you know, sort of largely share our assessment and our concerns on that front. Dr. Ratner, I want to give you the opportunity to, to close out with any final thoughts, anything we didn't touch on, Ukraine, North Korea, or just anything you want to foot stomp on your way out the door? Well, uh, I'm tempted to ask you, Mackenzie, a whole bunch of questions, including uh, what should Congress be doing uh, to support our efforts in the Indo-Pacific? I know you've got a lot of great answers to that and are doing terrific work on this, so look forward to all you're, all you're doing here at AAI. I think, I guess I would just say that, um, you know, the administration is making a commitment to the Indo-Pacific. This is something that is in our strategy documents, but I think what we've seen over the last several months uh, and, and since the beginning of the administration is a real commitment to that. We obviously had the president out in the region, the vice president, secretary of state spending a lot of time there. We're getting the secretary of defense out there uh, quite a bit. Um, and I think we're trying to, as we're doing that, providing uh, the sort of manifestation of what people have talked about, the rebalance, the priority theater, and what does that look like in terms of uh, capabilities, posture, uh, concepts and otherwise, if there's sort of one thing 
uh, out of the national defense strategy that I think is really important is the identification of the PRC as the pacing challenge, as the priority, um, recognizing the acute threat from Russia, and obviously the Ukraine issue is uh, on the front of uh, everybody's uh, card these days. Um, but while that is all happening, I think the department is making good through strategy and importantly through budget and all the work being done in the department that uh, the PRC really is the pacing challenge and the focus. Uh, and that's for all the reasons uh, that we talk about here today and are in the report. Well, I want to thank you on behalf of Zach and Corey and myself and your team for all the hard work that you did, not just to write the report, but to make progress on these terrific announcements coming next year. I'm going to, I'm going to be listening, watching, and talking with you about them. Please join me in thanking our friends from the Pentagon.